Hey gang, welcome to unit two. This unit is all about the cell and we are going to spend a ton of time studying about cells structure and more importantly their function, so how a cell works. So to kick it all off, we're going to get into a little bit of the basics and to do that we really have to begin by talking about cell theory. Cells haven't been always known. Um, there was a time when we didn't even know that living things were made of cells and all it wasn't until a guy by the name of Robert Hooke came along and he was the first person to observe cells. Um, in fact, he coined the term by observing pieces of cork that had been sliced very thinly under a light microscope. So what was really cool is he would set this very thin piece under the microscope and he would look at that thin section and what he saw were basically these shapes that kind of looked a little bit like this very geometric and squarish and what appeared to be empty and lo and behold since they were empty they looked like empty rooms and so he called them a cell since that was a pretty standard term for an empty room and so given that he was observing and was the first to observe cells, he gave us the first piece of the cell theory, um, which is that cells are the basic unit of life. A few years down the road, I guess fast forward maybe a hundred or so, um, two gentlemen by the name of Schleiden and Schwann come by and they are actually ones to begin looking at various life forms and they start noticing that every type of life that they would section and observe under a microscope also was made of cells and in turn gave us part two of the cell theory which is that all living things are made of cells. So Robert Hooke, cells are the uh, fundamental unit of life. They are, you know, that's what life is made of. All life is made of cells. Schleiden and Schwann they have give us that second piece which is that all life is made of cells then we have part three Virchow Virchow he was one to notice that new cells were constantly arising from previous cells and so his term all cells beget cells and really beget what that means is give rise to so all cells give rise to other cells basically life begets life we can't have life just poof, out of nowhere and to be really honest this here this is why this is a theory and you know if you take a second scratch your head for a minute you might realize why why is it that this is a cell theory if all cells create other cells what's the question that you're thinking right now hmm let me guess I bet you're thinking okay so where'd the first cell come from and that's what a lot of us think and that's what a lot of us think of and that's where a lot of debate is and that's what a lot of us don't know and so until we figure out you know some amazing answer to that I'm not sure if we'll ever know uh, where the first cell came from because none of us what's really neat about some of the cells and some of the basic pieces of cells is that there's universal structures about cells and by universal what I mean is there's life um, and all life that we have discovered at this point in time has consistencies there are threads that bind us all together it's kind of like the force right you know binds us. Um, I don't know if there are any Star Wars fans out there, but so some of these universal structures are the plasma membrane. Now we've already mentioned this one. This one's come up and it's come up because the main component is the phospholipid. So we've talked about that and the fact that all living cells, their membrane, the cell membrane, that boundary is all comprised of phospholipids and built in the same way it's a pretty neat um, consistency that there is in life. So the plasma membrane, it acts as a boundary and it's 
big deal, its big job, is that it regulates the, the material movement in and out of cells. The second part of our unit is going to spend time talking about that. That's what we are going to focus on, how cells move substances in and out of them. And so the plasma membrane is going to be a pretty important key to that. Uh, I like to equate the, the membrane as being like a bouncer at a nightclub. They are there to also moderate um, signal reception. They get the messages um, embedded in through that phospholipid membrane are proteins all over the place carrying out multitudes of jobs from being tunnels and channels and uh, hormone receptors to being literally almost like antennas and there to receive signal and to recognize basically cells like them. They're there to make sure that there's nothing foreign invading. Another consistency that life has is some form of a DNA containing region. And by that, I mean that there's an area where the DNA hangs out. Now, in some cells, that's going to be comprised in a nucleus. In other cells, it's going to kind of be free floating in its own spot. But all living cells contain DNA. There's also cytoplasm, <laughs> if you want to think about it, the goo that everything floats around in. Most cells are made of primarily water, but there are other substances in there and other molecules, some of like the carbohydrates we talked about, um, some of the other proteins that provide a substance and give it dimension and give it um, thickness that allow for everything to kind of float around in, so ribosomes. They exist in every cell, and what's really neat about ribosomes is that they are a functioning structure. Ribosomes are most important because they are involved in protein synthesis. Um, I think you've gotten the hint pretty hard for me already that proteins are like ridiculously important in living things. Well, this is where they're made. All those amino acids are strung together into the primary structure at a ribosome and every living cell, prokaryotic, eukaryotic, doesn't matter, contain ribosomes. So speaking of prokaryotic, eukaryotic, we're going to start by talking a little bit about the differences here. Uh, it's a cell structure type. comes down to really one basic thing. Prokaryotes, either, um, you know, for prokaryotes and eukaryotes, either the cell contains membrane-bound organelles or they don't. If they do, they're eukaryotic. If they don't, they're prokaryotic. So for example, here is a prokaryotic cell right here. So this one is prokaryotic. Um, these are basically your bacteria. So your archaea bacteria, your um, eubacteria are all considered prokaryotic cells. No organism that contains prokaryotic cell structure is multi-celled. They are all um, single-celled organisms. They contain no membrane-bound organelles. Their DNA is contained uh, in a region floating around in cytoplasm stippled with ribosomes. They have a cell membrane, a plasma membrane. They also may have an associated cell wall, um, perhaps a flagella here, which would be for movement, something along those lines if they were to move. Um, but they're pretty simple when it comes down to it. Whereas eukaryotes, they're probably what you learned about in middle school when you talked about cells. These are your cells that have it all. Here are your eukaryotes. Eukaryotes um, differ from prokaryotes in that they have all of those membrane-bound organelles. And I want you to focus right here on this cell. Okay, this cell here is a typical plant cell. It contains all of those things that we've talked about. Um, the big difference with eukaryotes versus, versus prokaryotes is that eukaryotes have membrane-bound organelles. They have a nucleus, they have a mitochondria, they have chloroplasts if they're a plant cell. Um, we'll be getting pretty, pretty heavy into these coming up, but these are things. Whereas prokaryotes, they don't have those. They, again, they have ribosomes, they have DNA region, they have cytoplasm. We have the cell wall. The cell wall is found in um, really four out of the five, I should say, 
five out of the six kingdoms. Monera here, I have clumped together. Um, really what we're talking about are your two bacteria kingdoms, um, the archaea and the eubacteria, but plants, fungus, your bacteria, some, some of the protists have cell walls. This is the outermost structure of the cell. This is not to be confused with the membrane. Very outermost structure, very, very solid, provides the cell with rigidity. Okay, so here is just a little bit of some background um, about the cell wall. It's for support. It's a protective measure. Um, but the key is, is it's not solid. It's very porous, and which is really important because the cell needs to be able to mobilize and move things in and out. And if it can't do that because the cell wall is too thick, then it can't function. Um, that ability to move substances is tantamount to the survival of a cell. A couple of levels of cell wall structure. You have the primary cell wall. Uh, this is very flexy, very pliable, um, often made of cellulose, which is a complex carbohydrate. This is what you find mainly for plants. Um, chitin is the cell wall um, structure you know, choice for fungus. Um, you're going to have certain glycoproteins and pectins, again, proteins that are going to be um, weaved and incorporated into this cell wall. The secondary cell wall um, forms later sometimes in development. It's more solid than the primary, but still has that porous nature to it and can be composed of lignin, again, another protein. And I can't stress this enough, do not confuse this function with a cell membrane's function. Two different structures, every cell has a cell membrane, not every cell has a cell wall. So speaking of the cell membrane, um, it's not just a lipid bilayer, it's so much more than that. And I'm just gonna do a quick overview, we'll get into more of it down the road. Uh, but just to give you a heads up on some of the things about the cell membrane besides its structure. You already know about phospholipid properties. It's, it's not just phospholipid though. There are embedded proteins strewn throughout. So much so that we refer to the cell membrane as the fluid mosaic model because there are so many proteins shoved all over. I want you to note the functional types. Now this is noted in your uh, textbook as well. We have proteins, membrane proteins that act as pumps. We have proteins that are embedded for recognition, again, self to self, cell to cell recognition. We have receptor proteins here. Um, these, very important. These are all uh, going to receive hormones as they travel through. Um, again, we have some more pumps here. Uh, channels, these are so things can get in and out uh, that can't necessarily just fit through the bilayer. So many types, so many different roles, all of them distinctly different proteins. And can you note, can you see any levels of protein structure in there? Just as a little reminder of all of that. The, mo the most important jobs that the membrane does is again that idea of regulating materials in and out. And the permeability here is a very important buzzword right here. The permeability of the membrane is going to be very dependent on these proteins. Um, and by permeability, we mean the ability for something to cross it. Okay, that's if, if, a, if a membrane is extraordinarily permeable, lots of things can pass. If a membrane is impermeable, I am permeable, uh, then that substance cannot cross it. So permeability is crucial, and a lot of times substances have to cross through these proteins in order to get in or out. So with that, I'm going to call it quits for today, and we'll be seeing you guys in class. So have a good one, and we'll talk to you guys later.